What's up everyone, this is Harrison Barnes, and today's conversation is with Alencia Johnson. She is a social impact, brand engagement, and communication specialist um, who's worked on a number of different uh, political campaigns, including this last presidential one. We're gonna be talking about all the work that she's done and just the insights she's gained from that. Alencia, I appreciate the time today. So excited to be here. So let's get started with you. You've been a part of so many monumental presidential campaigns. Former President Barack Obama in 2012, Senator Warren in 2019, and most recently, President Biden's campaign. What's one thing about being on a presidential campaign that no one tells you? Oh, wow. <laughs> so many things. Um, but I think the trend through all of those, and I'll, I'll just say as a girl from small town in Virginia, I'm actually overwhelmed when I think about the opportunities to serve. Um, and what I was not prepared for is the fact that not only are your days extremely long, like 18, 20 hour days, um, but you are going to learn on the job. And as with any job, you know that um, you're going to do more than a job description, but I'm talking about even more than a job description. Like even if you're supposed to be managing press, you still might have to go knock on doors and do some field stuff. Um, so you just get in the trenches. And that's something that no one prepares you for. But to be honest, um, it's something I think that's shaped my whole career. I'm a really strong believer in if you can't see it, you can't be it, right? What do you think it means for little Black girls in the world to see a Black woman holding the second highest political office in America? You know, it is so incredibly powerful and representation matters. When I was growing up, people used to ask me what I wanted to do in life. And I would say I wanted to be a reporter. I wanted to be an anchor. And that was mainly because I believe that people like you and I wouldn't necessarily get engaged in the civic process if they weren't hearing from people who looked like us from our community, right? It's one thing to hear, you know, people who are experts, when those experts look like you, or when those experts are the people in your community, you're so much more engaged. And then, you know, deeper into that, there needs to be more of us at the policy tables. There needs to be so many more of us making the decisions about the laws that are going to impact us. And this is at the policy level, this is in the political process, it's also in corporations and major brands. And I'm sure you know this, right? Yeah. And so when fast forward to Senator, now, excuse me, Vice President Harris, um, it's so important for us to have representation at that level because we can see it, we see what's possible, and also we trust that someone has our best interests. I mean, the White House, just like last week, was Black Maternal Health Week, and there's been this national conversation about Black women dying at high rates of child um, birth, and that wouldn't have been taken seriously if it wasn't for a Black woman in that number two seat, right? If it wasn't for a Black woman who has a record on these issues. And so it's so important. And the little girls that I've met throughout the years, especially in the last year, who look up to not only Vice President Harris, but seeing the Black women that have been around her, the Black women around all of these presidential candidates is really powerful. And I think we'll see a whole new class of young Black women running for office and you know, reaching out to hopefully have these jobs and these positions as well. Speaking of representation and speaking of kind of the civic process, it's my belief that a lot of young Americans and Gen Z in particular are kind of losing faith in our political system. Why do you think that is? Listen, I've worked in politics for over a decade and there are days when I wake up like, is this going to change? I'm literally in the DC area <laughs> getting frustrated and I'm gonna be real honest right now. We're having a casual conversation, a family conversation. I'm tired of white, old white men making decisions for a majority of a population that aren't white men, right? Women are the majority, people of color are becoming the majority. We are diversity of backgrounds, of genders, of sexualities so much diversity here and it feels like we make incremental progress or these social movements become the topic of conversation from the movement for black lives i mean right now we're all watching this case right now of george floyd's murderer and you have the me too movement ronald burke has done amazing work you see all these movements and then our policies not only are stagnant, but they're almost regressive. I mean, I was listening to a podcast this morning 
about what's happening with mass shootings and how the increase of mass shootings over the last year, that is a direct result of letting the assault ban expire years ago, right? And so I understand how young people are like, we are trying to do everything, but it feels as though the system is rigged against us. Um, but what I do have faith in, and you know, I'm in my 30s, so I'm still young, but like these really young folks, like these first time voters who are 18 and who are in college, like my little cousins who get so fired up and are figuring out even, you know, more strategic ways to put pressure on a system, more strategic ways to ensure that folks are hearing from them and listening to them. Um, I'm hopeful, they actually give me hope that we can change the system and that we have a more reflective democracy, not just at the federal level, but also in the state and the local level. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I mean, this last election, there was so much riding on it, just beyond you know who was gonna sit in the White House, but more importantly, um, what is the outlook of this country gonna be like? Mm -hmm. So my next question for you is, what are your hopes for this administration and what are you hoping that they prioritize? Oof. That's such a loaded question because I feel like I have a whole <laughs> list. I have a laundry list of things, Harrison. Like how much of time course, of course. <laughs> um, you know, when uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris took their oath and started uh, their administration, he talked about the crises that we have, and one of which is racial justice. Yeah. And I am hopeful that they prioritize that in a way that is beyond the conversation that most people are having in the mainstream. I think when people hear racial justice, they're thinking about the movement for Black Lives, which has been very much centered in criminal justice reform. Absolutely, that is a critical issue. It's something that people have spent their lives working on. But when I think of racial justice, it has to be intersectional. It has to be for women of color as well. It has to be for LGBTQ people of color. When we're talking about climate change, let's talk about environmental justice and understanding that people of color bear the brunt of climate change, right? When we're talking about economic insecurity. And so I really want them to prioritize racial justice in a way that we see it at every single corner of policy, education, housing, environment, all of these things. And so it is the most pressing thing for me. Um, it is pressing because we see how white supremacy is running rampant in our country. It has been normalized. The fact that we are talking about this in a way that isn't just academic shows you that more people are paying attention. And there was a study that came out after the January 6th insurrection. And I think all the people of color knew what it was, but you know, all the commentators wanted to say, Oh, this was people's economic insecurity. They were frustrated with the election results. The study came out and showed there were concerns that people of color were going to take over this country, right? And, and that they were losing power, that white people were losing power. And I think all the black and brown folks were like, we could have told you this, but we haven't gotten to a place where people are understanding how racism shows up and understanding how racism actually impacts everyone, not just people of color, but racism is actually harmful to all people. And so we solve this issue of race. I think, not I think, I know everyone else will benefit from it. And hopefully we have a more just and equitable uh, society. So we're gonna play a little hypothetical. You have a political magic ball and you're allowed to pass one legislation right now, whatever legislation you want. What would it be? Oof. Mm. Honestly, uh, the voting rights legislation that, um, you know, every single one of our rights boils down to our ability to exercise our right to vote. And as we see what we've seen happen in Georgia and how immediately uh, Republicans, unfortunately, got really partisan and said, you know what, we can't win these honestly, so we are going to create some laws to reduce the barrier, or, or sorry, to increase the barrier of entry to voting, and it directly impacts low-income folks and Black and brown folks. And so I think at the federal level, we have to take this seriously, and we have to figure out a way to ensure that we have more opportunities and access to voting, that there are less barriers and that more people can engage in the process. And so I, I believe that that is the key because when we have more people voting, we'll have a more reflective democracy. People's needs will hopefully be met, right? It leads into so many other things. And so that for me is the number one priority 
and Washington, D.C. And so hopefully Joe Biden gets rid of the decides that he agrees to get rid of the filibuster so that we can hopefully get this piece of legislation passed really soon. I think I think that's extremely important just because so many times people only focus on voting rights when an election is you know, a few days away or it's time to register and people will forget about all of the work and all the suppression that goes into um, these elections years in advance. Mm -hmm. Um, So by the time all of that is established, you know, you're already behind the eight ball. You're not going to get that stuff accomplished. So I think that's very, um, that's a very important piece of legislation for sure. Yeah. So as somebody that's, you know, much more dialed in than myself or the average American, Who's a politician that you got your eye on? Somebody that really impresses you and you're excited to follow in the coming years? I think I'm biased because I, I know her personally, but she is so amazing. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley from Massachusetts, which I'm sure you've heard of. Hopefully, Very impressive. Her. She's amazing. But I remember meeting her when she was a councilwoman um, in Boston. I was working for Planned Parenthood at the time, their national office, and she was doing amazing work on the council um, around so many issues. She was a champion for reproductive rights, and she stood up and challenged an incumbent who, you know, he was he had a good voting record, but we needed someone who was more bold, more progressive, and who really understood how to have uh, justice at the center of all of your pieces of policy. So. I love Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, and she always looks fly while she is also taking people to task. And so um, that is someone that I want people to follow. I'm going to drop in one more person too, Congresswoman Cori Bush, because she came from the streets. And if young people really want to get involved and see how they can have an impact, she came from organizing in the streets and ran twice. And now she's a sitting member of Congress and again, pushing these policies that we really need. I will say, and both of them are extremely funny and informative follows on social media. I follow yeah. them both. I definitely enjoy uh, the content that they put out. I think they, they keep it real, but they also um, have that educational piece mm-hmm. and um, just letting their followers know everything that's going on, not yeah. only in DC, but just uh, you know around the country as well. Yeah. And what you said is so important because um, they talk about policy, which can be very, very complicated. Even myself working in this, it's very complicated for me, but they have a way of talking about it that invites other people into the conversation who think it's above their head, right? It's very relatable. You can understand it. And they talk about it in simple terms of like centering people who really need opportunity, education, clean water, fair wage. Like they just talk about it in such in ways that really invite people into the conversation. And I love it. 100%. I mean, there, there was definitely a time where, you know, even someone like myself who who had somewhat of an interest in learning more about politics, it was so dense that it was, a lot of it was just like over your head mm-hmm. and just kind of seeing this new wave of politicians who not only are one social media savvy, but two right. can simplify it, you know, is, mm-hmm. it's been great. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Planned Parenthood. Uh, I know you spent six years there. Can you tell me what your years were like and what was the biggest thing that you learned? Yeah, that was an interesting time in my life and I'm really grateful for it. And I'll be very honest, I did not want to work for Planned Parenthood. This was right after <clears throat> the Obama campaign. And for me, I, I just knew I was going to go work in the administration or do something directly in government. I've always been committed to agency as a woman. I consider myself a feminist, more so a womanist. Um, I believe in reproductive rights, all of that. But as a Black woman, I didn't see myself in an organization that I thought was for white women. I didn't see myself in it. And I had some good mentors who said, you know what, you should go there and actually try to give them the perspective that you have to expand the conversation, to engage more Black people, more Black women. Because for me, I have always believed this been the thread through my career. A lot of times it's not the message, it's the messenger, right? You could have several different people on the same message, but people engage with the different folks in different ways. And so I spent six years there uh, figuring out narrative strategies of how 
you know, the issues of reproductive rights intersects with criminal justice and immigration, because it does. All of this is about body autonomy, right? About agency over our bodies. I also spent a lot of time working to, you know, shift the narrative and have conversations with the diversity among even our community as Black folks, right? Like you and I have different perspectives on so many different things and so do the millions of other Black folks in this country. And so how do you have a conversation about agency and sexuality and, you know, however you enter the conversation is valid so long as you have access to um, opportunity education and healthcare. And I learned so much there. I learned a lot about culture change strategy. And what I mean is, using the levers of influence in our culture from corporations, the entertainment industry, all of these things that people think are frivolous and don't need to make a statement on a major issue, I actually learned that's the real strategy to shift power. The LGBTQ movement said, forget negotiating with politicians decades ago, they went straight for corporations, they started building storylines that were really reflective in the entertainment industry. And decades later, they had policies that started to protect them. And so I was doing that for reproductive rights. Um, and I was also, uh, I led with a couple of other Black women, a campaign that is still going strong, Stand with Black Women. We might have to send you a t-shirt. Okay, um, I like that. And that allowed a lot of people to enter the conversation. So there would be, you know, weeks where, I'm at Sundance Film Festival having a conversation about storylines of reproductive rights. And then I'm going to a major corporation and then we're doing a, a big you know, action at a state capitol. And all of this was centered around the agency of Black women in our bodies and how reproductive health care is a critical piece of it. And so I learned so much there. I met so many amazing people and had so many dope opportunities. And also it just really confirmed that Black women are lit and like all of Black women and we come up with some amazing things. And so long as you protect us and let us, you know, actually live in our creativity and our experience, you know, you know we can actually change the world. So I, I, I enjoyed my time there and I'm still so committed to the work that they do. That is that is an undisputed fact uh, for sure. Uh, you mentioned it's not about the message. It's not about the message. It's about the messenger. Um, you recently started 1063 West Broad, your own social impact agency. What problem were you originally hoping to solve when you launched that platform? For me, and this is something that I learned from my grandmother, um, God rest her soul, that's actually what my agency is named after. That was her address in a small town in Southern Virginia. That was her address. And I want every single person to understand the power that they have to make change. I always get, you know, people coming up and asking questions. Alencia, how can I do this? How can I, you know, work on a campaign and do the work that you're doing or do the work that some of your friends are doing? Some of my friends who have been in conversation with you. And I said, I actually need for you to live in your purpose and do the thing that you have been called to do. Because if we're all doing that, then we can all collectively change society. And so for me, 1063 works with whether it's a fashion company or a tech company or nonprofits or whoever it is, I have, I have a diversity of clients. I'm teaching them how, what is your mission? What is your mission? What do you value? And how can you live that out in a way that's inclusive and disruptive? Because I believe we have to be a little bit of table shakers, some disruptors in order to do the most good. And, you know, I don't want people or organizations or brands to think, oh, I need to be like this one over here. No, you need to be true to yourself. And once you are true to yourself, we can we can do the most good. And so hopefully through this work, I can help, you know, it's a, it's a small way for me to help, you know, a little bit of change um, with a lot of impact and every person's sphere of influence. And how do you encourage people um, who maybe have smaller platforms, right? If they say, look, you know, we're kind of a startup, you know, fashion brand, obviously we're not the biggest or, you know, we're just a small film studio or we're just a small organization, you know, what is our impact really going to do? Mm -hmm. It's important to remember that everyone started somewhere. So look at, let's look at Issa Rae, for example. I remember watching her YouTube videos, Awkward Black Girl, and I like saw myself there, right? And she just kept going. And one of my best friends says this all the time to me, she's like, you just got to keep 
going and if you are doing what is authentic to you it's going to come right the the influence is going to come the growth is going to come but more importantly i think so many people are looking for authenticity and so long as you say stay authentic to yourself you're going to have impact and you're going to reach people that you may not know you are reaching and that's the thing i think we forget sometimes we see what's right in front of us but not seeing the impact that we're making, um, not seeing the influence that we have. And I tell brands and people as they're starting, um, whether they're doing you know, it's storytelling or if they're in the media or if they're a company, there's all this research that shows, we were talking about young people earlier, mm-hmm. young people and people of color and women are expecting fashion brands, big companies, the the media they consume to tackle these issues. Actually, I read this study the other week that people of color, particularly black folks, trust companies, corporations, and brands more than the government to talk about the critical issues. And so, so long as you are being authentic to yourself and understanding the problems that really make sense for you to talk about, that will eventually grow. But you got to keep going. And also get off social media because I think social media makes us realize, oh, I gotta, I've got to reach A to Z in three months. That's not what's going to happen. You got to go in the lab and just like put your head down and get the work done um, and it will have long lasting impact. Speaking of social media, you know, I feel like recently, you know, we've just been drowning in headline after headline of tragedy, whether it's the Derek Chauvin trial, um, the release of the body cam footage of the murder of Adam Toledo, the murder of Dante Wright, and multiple mass shootings. Um, you know, I know for me, you know, it can kind of just, you kind of just get that sense of, of hopelessness, um, mm-hmm. just, just seeing all of that. How do you stay dialed in and maintain your mental health during these constant news cycles? It's such a hard, I think it's a hard question to answer um, for all of us. And even, you know, someone like myself has to stay on top of these issues, but as black folks, as women, as, as someone who was a part of a historically marginalized community, no matter what our job is, this personally impacts us, right? Um, and I, I think it's important for us to know that it is okay to actually take a break. It is okay to take a little break from Twitter or social media or even the news. I I actually stopped watching cable news when Donald Trump was first elected. And people were like, wait a minute, you do media and social justice and advocacy. And I said, this is actually not helping my spirit when I'm already seeing my brothers and sisters die at the hands of police, these mass shootings. There's so many things going on. And in order for me to do what I'm supposed to do to change this, I've got to protect myself, right? And and also understanding that that protection and that break, that comes with us a little bit of a privilege, right? There are communities who cannot step away from this, right? They still step outside and their communities are infiltrated with police, but there's no job, there's no job opportunity here, right? We're living in a food desert, but there's police presence everywhere. And so I understand that that sometimes comes from a place of privilege, but I, I see that as a responsibility that I have in order to fill that gap when I know other people are literally just fighting for their existence every single day. And so you, you, we have to do something that protects our spirit in order to rebuild our strength for us to be able to continue to keep going. And we've got to find joy, right? We've got to find joy. We've got to take care of ourselves. Audre Lorde says this and everybody talks about it. Self-care is an act of political warfare. It is, it literally is. When I am whole and able to fight back, that is political warfare. And Stacey Abrams said this too, when we were talking about voting rights, she said, you know, this tactic of oppression and um, wearing us out to the point of exhaustion, that is a tactic. Right, and we have to understand that that is a tool. And so, for us, we have to make sure that we don't get there. Right, we take the breaks that we need and still keep going. Um, and lastly, I'll say this: you know, the videos are constantly being shared. Um, and then on the flip side, you have people who are putting up black squares and saying, "We're going to do this as a company," and a year later, they haven't done anything. Um, but there's there's a something that I'm wrestling with, with the amount of trauma that has, is to, at this point for me, sometimes I feel like it's being exploited, right? Like our trauma is being exploited to people who are saying, oh, I'm paying attention, I'm paying attention, but yet you've not done anything. And so do I, do, 
we have to constantly relive this trauma for you to still not do anything, right? So like, how do we figure out a way to protect our souls while also pushing the people with power to finally actually change? I mean, I, I don't, after Tamir Rice was shot and killed, I'm like, this is a baby, right? We, and we can name all these babies who are, I mean, Adam, 12 years old, okay. and you're still not doing anything about this? So I don't think these videos are actually helping you change. It's just actually recreating this trauma for us as black folks and you're still not doing anything. And so we've got to figure out a way to protect ourselves while also pushing the people with power to make, to change. No, I agree hundred percent. And you know, one thing I've always tried to, I try to do now um, is not necessarily share as many videos on mm -hmm. social media because you know, it is traumatic. You know, you're constantly going in your feed. You're constantly seeing these videos on a loop. Um, and, you know, we do know that the algorithms of these platforms, you know, highlights the extremes, highlights the things yeah. that are going to get the most uh, interactions, uh, you know, and controversy. But my last question on a, on a, on a more positive note, um, and look at the next generation of leaders, activists, entrepreneurs, influencers, what gives you hope? that they are all so committed to the work and committed to the work by first redefining what it looks like. They've said, you know what? What y'all did was cool, it was great, but we're gonna do this a little bit differently. We're gonna do it our way and we will tear down the system and build a new. And it literally gives me so much hope that this world will be so much better um, because of the things that they are doing, the things that they're fighting for. Again, like I mentioned, in my little cousins and my mentees who are in college or coming out of college, the things that they talk about and their passion for it and desire for it. And they're, you know, they don't like to hear no. And so they're not gonna take no for an answer. And that literally gives me so much hope that they will do even more work than, you know, we're doing right now. Um, and they're also teaching us. They're teaching so many more of us um, how to actually show up and this, you know, incremental change, it's not working anymore. And that constant reminder, um, that just, that gives me hope. They're ready to walk over, walk in places and flip over tables while some of us are like, oh, let's just fight for more seats at the tables. They're like, nah, we're gonna flip this whole table over and build a new, and I'm here for it. And I, I will be there with them building a new table. And so, you know, hopefully the world will become what we can radically imagine for it to be um, because of their leadership. Alencia, for people who wanna tap in with you and the work that you're doing, where's the best place they can find you on social media? I am at Alencia Johnson on Instagram and Twitter, and we can have the conversations there. Perfect. I definitely appreciate the time. Thank you so much for this conversation. And uh, I look forward to following all the good things that you're doing. Thank you. And thank you for using your platform to do this. It's so important. I appreciate it.